we see from alumni, parents, employees, and friends of the university. Thanks for your confidence in us. We will continue to be conscientious stewards of our resources. We recognize our responsibility to ensure that students leave their UT experience with knowledge and problem-solving abilities to develop a better world. The Creating Tomorrow campaign has electrified a new sense of pride and enthusiasm about what is possible for UT when we all work together. Your passion and dedication are elevating this university ever higher. We are indeed fortunate to count you as our friends. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your, your support. support. Welcome to the University of Tampa. My name is Tucker Whitman and I'm a junior marketing major here at UT. Today we're going to look at some of the highlights of our beautiful Riverside campus here in downtown Tampa. We'll start at Plan Hall. This historic building was opened in 1891 as the Tampa Bay Hotel and now serves as the main academic building here at UT with four floors of classrooms as well as faculty and administrative offices. Next up, the Vaughn Center, the hub of campus life and activities. This multi-purpose building includes the campus bookstore, our primary cafeteria plus an additional food court, a theater, as well as offices and meeting rooms for student organizations. The Vaughn Center is also one of UT's residence halls, providing five floors of student rooms. Morsani Hall is another residence hall here at UT. In addition to housing approximately 450 students, this building offers another selection of eateries as well as a small grocery store. Now let's check out the Sykes College of Business. This academic building houses classrooms and faculty offices for UT's undergrad and graduate business students. This building also has a real-time stock trading room. Right next door is the Sykes Chapel for Faith and Values. This gorgeous interfaith chapel features a large main hall complete with a massive pipe organ as well as meditation rooms and meeting rooms. Student healthcare is a major priority for us here at UT. The Dickey Health and Wellness Center is accessible to all students and provides high quality services including basic medical care, counseling and wellness programs. On the east side of campus you'll find the McDonald Kelsey Library. Here, students can learn from a large collection of books, periodicals, and digital databases. They can also take advantage of our numerous study rooms and computers. The Academic Success Center is another great resource for students. This is your one-stop shop for academic advising, coaching, and tutoring services. Whether you're a seasoned athlete or just want to shoot some hoops, the athletic facilities here at UT are hard to beat. The Bob Martinez Athletic Center includes a large gymnasium, a weight room, and training facilities. In addition, the campus features an aquatic center open year-round, six tennis courts, baseball and softball fields, a 1,500-seat stadium, as well as a lacrosse field and intramural complex. Need a break from studying? Head to Falk Theater and catch a play. This 1,000-seat historic theater serves as a home for all major performances made by UT's Department of Speech, Theater and Dance, as well as special guests. This is one of UT's newest facilities, the Innovation and Collaboration Building. Here you will find UT's very own Starbucks, in addition, classrooms, cybersecurity labs, study lounges, and the Loth Entrepreneurship Center designed for student entrepreneurs to launch their startups. Thanks for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video tour of UT, we'd love to give you one in person. For more information or to schedule a campus visit, go to ut.edu. Champions know how to seize opportunities. When they see moments of greatness unfold right before their eyes, they push as hard as they possibly can. And then they push harder. Because the heart of a champion never settles, never quits, and never stops giving its all. We are champions. We are Division II. We go big, we give it everything we've got, and we win on the field, on our campuses, in our communities, for our causes, in our careers. We rise to become champions in everything we do. 
We are Division II, and there are no limits here. We make our time count. We set our own path. We become champions on our terms. It's time to up your game, because we're here to play and learn. But most importantly, we're here to discover ourselves, our vision, our heart, our drive, to achieve every goal we aim for, because we want to be champions at the highest level, life. At Division II, the opportunities are here. Are you ready? In the late 1920s, the prospect of a Hillsborough High student enrolling in college was bleak. The nation was in the throes of the Great Depression. Businesses were failing, and many of Tampa's beautiful waterfront homes were left abandoned. The principal at Hillsborough High, Frederick Spaulding, didn't see these barriers. He only saw bright young students who were in need of a place to continue their learning. In 1931, collegiate-level courses were offered at Hillsborough High. This would later become the University of Tampa. On August 2, 1933, Spaulding arrived at the doors of Plant Hall with a hundred-year lease from the city and a firm resolve, and with the turn of a key, opened the door to the University of Tampa. In its fledgling years, UT was fortunate if it could collect half of the tuition due from its students. It was only through the dedication of its professors, who worked without pay, that the university survived the Great Depression. Over the next several decades, UT grew slightly enrolling up to 1,800 at times, starting several sports teams, and even began accepting students from other areas of the country. But in the early 90s, the growth seemed to stand still, even stop. UT needed new life, some passion. UT needed strong leadership. In 1995, Dr. Vaughn became president and UT began to transform. A thousand UT students has become 7,200, and we are now entering our 17th consecutive year of record enrollment. All the while, UT's academic profile continues to increase. There has been $350 million in new construction since 2000. We have added seven new residence halls, academic buildings and labs, as well as athletic facilities. Plant Hall even got new carpet and new windows. UT now has more than 3,000 events annually and 200 clubs and student organizations. We have won 13 NCAA Division II championships, and since 2000, Spartan teams have won 35 Sunshine State Conference titles. As a member of the University of Tampa Spartan family, you are a guiding force behind UT's remarkable success. We are alums, students, parents, and friends, and together we are changing lives. We are individuals, yet the greater whole is only complete when we work together. You have helped make UT a vibrant community with growing resources and a superior reputation. Just like in the beginning when professors worked without pay, the spirit of giving at UT remains strong. Last year, nearly $14 million was donated to the university by thousands of generous supporters. When we strengthen education, we strengthen our job force and our nation as a whole. Donations support academics, campus life, and a student's ability to afford an education. 
Your participation is what matters most and shows that our Spartan family believes in the future of UT. Whatever level of support, your gift is important to us and enables UT to provide the challenging, high quality education that has defined our university. Thank you for helping UT achieve such great success. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. This is the University of Tampa. UT students travel from across the nation and around the globe to join a dynamic learning community. There are 150 academic programs, continuing studies for non-traditional students, and a highly ranked graduate school. Academic opportunities are extensive and rigorous, but this mid-sized residential campus retains a welcoming feel. With a student-faculty ratio of 16 to 1, students benefit from direct interaction with expert faculty, a faculty that is passionate about teaching and mentoring. Outside the classroom, UT enjoys a unique environment. Plant Hall, a national historic landmark, is surrounded by modern and historic buildings on 105 acres. UT's beautiful downtown riverfront setting offers a gateway to the heart of a vibrant city. Students are within walking distance of jobs and internships, and the recreational opportunities are endless, both off-campus and on-campus. Students live in upscale residence halls and enjoy diverse activities, including performing arts, guest lectures, nearly 200 clubs and organizations, and a nationally ranked NCAA Division II athletics program. The UT experience begins with an innovative first year program and continues with opportunities to challenge yourself in the honors program, to study abroad, to conduct research with faculty, to do an internship, to volunteer in the community, or to participate in multiple leadership programs. Explore your dreams, discover your talents, get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. Another ordinary day at UT.
for college sports. There's light at the end of the tunnel. A return to normal and all we love about sports. You've instilled resilience, focus, and selflessness in us. We've put those lessons to work. We've found strength and unity in each other. You continue to take us places we never imagined. You bring out the best in us. So when we look forward, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see a better world for all of us. And, and for college, college sports. sports. In NCAA Division II, student-athletes leave a lasting impression on their communities. That's because Division II student-athletes want to make a difference and truly be part of their surrounding communities. Through community engagement, thousands of student-athletes from various backgrounds interact with community members who view them as role models. This interaction leaves a positive and perhaps even life-changing impression on all those involved. In Division II, we rise to the opportunity and make community engagement ours. for nearly half a million college athletes a path to go pro in something other than sports. Learn more at NCAA.org slash opportunity. Being a champion takes more than skill, more than endless drills, more than using your head. Being a champion takes the heart to give it your all, the agility to thrive from any angle, and the relentless drive to be the best. Welcome to Division Two, where the pursuit is yours to create. And the question isn't, can you do it? It's will you. It's not about any one thing. It's about how everything comes together, how it all connects. People, ideas, Resources, community, everything. Quality of life services. That's what we do. Sodexo. What do you get when you take your favorite food and stuff it inside a pocket of homemade dough? perfectly until golden brown. It's a mouth-watering empanada from Mr. Empanada. No one makes a better empanada. Take Ted Webb's word for it. Almost as good as my mom used to make. Check out our website for a location near you. MrEmpanada.com school of fish. Watch as they mimic each other's every move. Even their own mothers can't tell these fish apart. In this school, there is no room for individualism. These fish live in fear. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa.
It is a beautiful Saturday morning here at the Namoli Family Stadium. And we are live for some UT softball, live on the Tampa Spartans TV network on Sunshine State Conference Network. I'm Taylor Storthy alongside. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and we saw these teams start the series last night with a heartbreaking defeat if you're a Spartans fan and an exciting victory if you're a Sharks fan. A game that the Spartans led 2 to nothing through five innings and then watch that evaporate to what became a 3-2 to two victory for the Sharks. And a very, very sunny, technically it's still Saturday morning, 11.58 Eastern Time. And a great day for softball here in West Central Florida as it's 83 degrees. And a great day for a doubleheader. Yeah, and if any of the doubleheaders are like the game we had last night, which it went to extra innings in a 3-2 Sharks victory... I think we'll have a good time. Starting on the mound is the pitcher who, unfortunately for her, was credited with the loss after conceding one run in the eighth inning. So in the circle will be Mariah Gallhouse. And Gallhouse had a really solid game last night in the field, making a few big plays, and now looking to get a little bit of revenge from the circle to open up game two of the series. First and pitch taken for strike one. The numbers for Galhouse so far in 2022, 11 appearances, started six games. She has a 4-3, and three, one loss record, two saves, five complete games, 47 innings pitch, and an impressive 1.34 earned run average. And along that stat line, 26 strikeouts and just six walks. Very efficient with getting strikeouts and efficient at keeping runners from scoring. And now we'll get ahead one and two in the count after the foul ball. Leading off for the Sharks is Sydney Legere, graduate student out of Miami, Florida. Legere also had a solid game, making some good plays in the outfield. The last time. But not going to be able to do anything here as Gullhouse gets strikeout number one in the circle tonight on a nice off speed to retire the first batter. That's a nice shot in the arm for her to start off the afternoon by striking out the first batter. Spartans, as I mentioned, trying to rebound from that loss last night. And meanwhile, it's worth noting, Nova Southeastern, they've got themselves a nice little streak going here because counting last night's victory, they have won five in a row. So trying to extend that streak and their overall one loss record of 11-7. and seven. Meanwhile, Tampa had taken the loss and is now on the one-game losing skid after having actually two-game losing skid. But out of their last few, they were able to win in the previous series they had last weekend, winning two of the last three. Now the 2-1-1 one, one here. That's going to be lined right to Curran Miner, who makes a brilliant catch. And on that play, Riley Langwell was able to take a line drive that was hit really well, but unfortunately for her, it landed right in Corin Miner's arms. And that first pitch, the off speed, it's able to fool Tia Williams here and gets Gullhouse up 0-1 in the count. Tia Williams, wow, through 18 games played this season, hitting 424, including 12 RBI. Five doubles, very dangerous hitter. Spartans, however, hoping to go one, two, three with the Sharks here to lead off this first game of the doubleheader. And the off speed works again. From the angle, it just looks like a riser, and that's where you're just very incentivized to take it. And then all of a sudden, it goes from the 12th position to the 6th position, right into the strike zone. The one, two, taken outside for ball two. And so now a 2-2 count with two outs with the number two at the plate. And just as a formality, as we're used to seeing, Lexi Chevalier, the catcher here for UT. It's going to be a grounder to short. The play, not in time. The throw just a second late, but a good job by Balmer to keep it in, in the infield. And that was a really tricky play. And we've seen Williams' speed before. She had advanced to first and gotten a hit off a bunt in the previous game. So not a surprise to see her beat it out, but that was definitely not Balmer's fault. It was a well-hit slow ball, and Balmer made a good play to make sure it was a con contest to get the throw into first. Yeah, you're right. The credit goes to Williams for her speed and allows the Sharks to stay alive here in the top of the first as we see 
Ali Janowiak here in the four position. And Janowick hitting in the four spot is going to be happy to have a runner on, but with two outs, it adds a little bit of pressure. Williams goes for second and steals it. No contest from Chevalier. Actually, they're going to be calling it out there. I think an obstruction call on the cat on Janowick. But regardless of that, the out is called and the side is now retired. Nova Southeastern do get one hit, but strand the runner on base. Well, we are back for bottom of the first. And at the end of the first inning, the steal attempt from Tia Williams just went a little too early, and that was the call for the third out. But for now, it brings Nova Southeastern into the field and Caitlin uh, Ellard onto the mound. Kate Ellard. So far in 2022, a 2.79 earned run average as you see the first pitch to the leadoff hitter, the pitcher, Mariah Galhaus. Ellard, her stat line, a 4-3, and three, one loss record, 37 and two-thirds innings pitched. Good stat line so far for Ellard, as Galhaus will send that one foul. Ellard has... Five complete games. It's allowed 18 runs. 15 of them earned. Has walked 15 batters and struck out 14. So not quite where she wants to be in that regard. But always a clean slate here starting off a new game. As you see, that one sent way down the left field line into foul territory. And it's the beauty of sports. It's why they play the game. Because in softball... Any different match for any player in the circle, they can get like a nine strikeout game with allow, allow, without allowing a walk, even if their walk to strikeout average isn't perfect. And that one's going to be fouled away by Gallhouse, and that'll drop pretty cleanly. And as you and I have talked about before on other broadcasts, let's give Gallhouse her due as a hitter because she's got a 327 batting average in 2022 including one home run and six RBI, 17 games played. Gullhouse a lot like Shohei Otani I've mentioned in the past with outfield prowess and pitching prowess being affected from the circle, in the field, and in the batter's box and has been moved up to be the leadoff batter today for the Spartans as she takes a ball outside to bring the count to 2-2. Two and two. Yeah, last night she was hitting in the number three position, so a little bit of a different look. And Leslie Cantor's batting order, at least for this first game of the doubleheader. And waiting behind her on deck is Lauren Fantone. And we'll also see this inning Corinne Miner. As even that's a change because Miner was hitting fourth last night. Chevalier slotted about fourth in this game. It usually is Gullhouse and Miner in the 3 4 spot. And now that has changed. But maybe one of the reasons they want Gallhouse first is because of her ability to be a spark plug and to get on base like she did there off a beautiful line drive into center field. So now, both teams now able to get a runner on base in the first inning. We'll see if the Spartans have some luck with it. 
as the Sharks, unfortunately, were not able to convert Tia Williams, having gotten to first, beating out an infield single. So now the dangerous threat will be uh, Gallhouse, who was able to seal a base last time. But this time it's going to be Fantone trying to lay a bunt down, but it goes right back into Emerson Morris's glove. Good reactions from Morris to get the first out of the inning. Morris replacing Fine in the catcher spot tonight, today. At least for the first game. We saw Madison Fine playing catcher there last time. And today, it's now Morris. And now up is Curran Miner with a runner on and one out. That's a situation you're going to want to have one of the best hitters in. And for Curran Miner, in the last four games, has had three home runs. And nearly had one last night with a well-hit ball that went all the way back to the wall. And it allowed her to get on base because the outfielder wasn't able to completely make a clean catch. Miner would love to extend a home run streak right here. And it would give Tampa an early lead. But that will be easier said than done. One on, a 1-1 one -one count, and one out. Ellard checks her wrist. And time is called. This is going to be a day, Taylor, when hydration is going to be so important for the athletes on both teams with a minimum of, well, you could say 13 innings if you say six and a half, but let's call it 14 innings between two teams that, granted, while they're both based in Florida, you can't underestimate that Florida sun, the Florida heat, making sure that they stay hydrated all afternoon. Going to be yep. in the sun for the entirety of, of both games. Exactly, Bruce, and it is a warm day out. It's not blistering hot. It's not like we're in the middle of the summer, but being outside for this long, and once you really get to the 13th and 14th innings of the day, that's definitely going to take a toll on your body. And so it'll be interesting to see what level of heat fatigue could be doing, and definitely the hydration breaks will be so important for all the players. Well, of course, with both of them having long pants, the Spartans black and no Southeastern with the blue tops, that's going to attract the heat even more. Maybe the Black Pants are kind of to try to get uh, hot legs going to maybe get them on fire to allow them to seal some bases a little bit faster. Either way, Miner flies out to right field. Had a good job in the at-bat to drive it to a full count, but unfortunately for her, won't be able to get on base with it. And now that'll bring up Lexi Chevalier. And I watched Corinne Miner on her way back to the dugout. A few words for Lexi Chevalier as to what she saw from pitcher Kate Ellard and even talked for a minute with Kate Russo, or excuse me, with Alexa Russo, who's on deck, and relayed the same information to her as to what to expect if she's able to get to the plate this inning, albeit two outs right now. So the 0-1 taken with a strike that was called inside. Fouled away by Chevalier, now down 0-2 with two outs. And I know for Chevalier, the heat is also going to be important because he doesn't have to worry just about the black pants attracting more heat, or even a black helmet, but also has all the catcher's gear on, which definitely will add a little bit of heat. The 0-2 right here, Chevalier is going to ground it up the middle, and it's not going to be within reach for Burke, so it will be a two-out single that brings up Alexa Russo. Yeah, and so Alexa Russo will get to utilize the information that she got from Corinne Miner and is fortunate enough to come to the batter's box in the bottom of the first with now two runners on for a UT. So I don't know if I want to go so far as to call it an early threat so much as an early opportunity for a UT. And there are two outs. A runner in scoring position does pose as you mentioned, an opportunity. A little bit less of a threat because all you need to do is retire one batter. But any ball that's hit into the outfield has potential to send Gallhouse home. And we've seen Gallhouse be pretty fast in the base path and getting some stolen bases. That one's going to be fouled to the left. But it's going to be in play for the third and final out of the inning. A great track down there by Alexis Smith. And the side is retired. Tampa gets two hits, but strands two. Uh, the unfortunate pattern of stranding runners on base that the Spartans have had to deal with this season continues as we enter the top of the second. We'll be right back on Tampa Spartans TV. College sports. There's light at the end of the tunnel. A return to normal 
and all we love about sports. You've instilled resilience, focus, and selflessness in us. We've put those lessons to work. We've found strength and unity in each other. You continue to take us places we never imagined. You bring out the best in us. So when we look forward, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see a better world for all of us. And, and for college, college sports. sports. In NCAA Division II, student-athletes leave a lasting impression on their communities. That's because Division II student-athletes want to make a difference and truly be part of their surrounding communities. Through community engagement, thousands of student-athletes from various backgrounds interact with community members who view them as role models. This interaction leaves a positive and perhaps even life-changing impression on all those involved. In Division II, we rise to the opportunity and make community engagement ours. We are back with the first pitch of the second inning. Taken outside for ball one. If you're just joining us, it was a pretty quiet first inning. There were three hits. Noah's inning ended after an early steal attempt. And for Tampa, it was a foul ball that was greatly caught by Alexis Smith, who tracked it down in foul territory. That one, the checkup, I don't think was in time. So the count will go to one and one for Ali Janowick. And, and the two hits for Tampa, the one hit for... Nova Southeastern, we don't have to worry about jinxing anybody by talking about a no-hitter or a perfect game, and the teams start to feel good about themselves that they're coming right out on a very early start, already feeling that they can hit the other pitcher, and so now it's just a matter of them finding their groove, and as you say, not only converting some of those base runners, but avoiding errors. Janowick's going to get it to the outfield, and it will fall behind Fantone, who can't get it down cleanly, and that will be an opening double to start out the second inning. Fantone was trying to track it down, and the ball just landed a couple inches behind her. Thankfully, it didn't roll all the way to the wall, so the Spartans can take a sigh of relief. But Janowick will definitely be pleased to get on base with a double. You know, it's really a game of inches. You think of a close play at the plate. You think of a ball that all of a sudden goes foul that might have otherwise been a home run. In a game of inches like that, Lauren Fantone was that close to making the catch, not close enough. And as a result, the Sharks are the runner at second base already. And so the first pitch of that at bat will be a ball. Taylor and I have also talked off the air about it being a game of inches as far as you've heard us say on previous broadcasts. Our vantage point from here, sometimes a ball looks like a strike, a strike looks like a ball. We're not the ones standing behind home plate, so it really is all the way around a game of inches. Yeah, because from our point of view, a ball that's just two inches outside will look like a strike. So that's just one of the crazy things about softball, just... The single inch can just make the largest of differences as there is the bunt that will advance the runner to third. A safe throw there for Curran Miner will get the first out. But the job wasn't to try to get a hit. It was to advance the runner, and it did that just fine. So Emerson Morris will definitely be happy with that at bat as now it'll bring up Madison Fine, who's hitting in the designated hitter spot today. To try to bring a runner I home. made the same comment last night. You know, they're happy to have the runner at third at the expense of, of only one out. It's not that there's two outs and the next one will end the half inning. So as you mentioned, she got the job done exactly what was asked of her. So the first pitch taken there for a strike. We've seen that type of pitch a few times. The off speed that looks like it's going to go up high, but instead falls right into the strike zone, leaving the batter dumbfounded. Overall, but aside from the hit, Gallhouse has been solid in the circle so far with a strikeout and only 19 pitches entering this at bat. There's going to be a grounder to short. Ballmer can't get it. So the Nova Southeastern Sharks will go up 1-0 and kind of feel a little bit bad because I think that was a accidental commentary curse. As well, I was mentioning it had been a clean 19 pitch start and the exact next pitch was a ground ball that was able to bring the runner home and give the Sharks an early lead. But it's, what it is is a great example of it being a game of inches. I mean, a real great athletic effort by Steph Ballmer, the diving attempt, and it was just not close enough to knock that one down and prevent the run from scoring. Gullhouse takes the out at second, so a fielder's choice on the bunt attempt. 
won't allow the runner to advance, but it will, however, put Haley Hendricks on first base now with two outs. I like that decision by Galhaus to get the lead runner because as easy as it would be out of muscle memory to go to first base, you take off the lead runner. Now they only have a runner at first, and there's two outs. So had it been the other way around, there might be two outs and still a runner in scoring position. She wants to make sure that she stops the bleeding where the Sharks have already gotten the first run of the game. And so good heads-up decision there by Mariah Galhaus. That one is going to be taken down low, and the count will go to a one and one. And yeah, exactly, whenever there's a bump play, you always want to try to get the lead runner, but most of the time you go to first because you don't want to risk having that runner be safe, and now you have two runners aboard. That one's taken, and the count will go to one and two now. A chance for Gallhouse to now end the top half of the inning after conceding that one run. That one's going to be taken, trying to steal second, but going to have to go back as she didn't get it in time. And a good play by Chevalier to get up quick enough to prevent the steal attempt from coming to fruition from Hendricks. The count's now 2-2. Two two. Strike 3, and that is another strikeout for Gallhouse, who apart from the one run conceded, has been very good in the circle. The Sharks are able to get one run, but... Tampa still has plenty of time to go as they get ready to bat in the bottom half of the order. We'll see you back in just one minute on Spartans TV. Bottom of the second here with EJ Jansen leading off for the Spartans. Nova was able to get their first run and take a lead in the top half of the inning. Jansen will take the first pitch here. It'll be a 1-0 count for the Spartans' first baseman. That one taken for strike one. Once again, the off speed that looks like it'll land a bit high, just droops a little bit low into the zone. Yeah, I'm impressed with Kate Ellard. Really has command of that pitch, using it to her success so far here in the first inning plus. Jansen will fly out right here to the third base player. And that is a very smart read by Tia Williams to track it down by the dugout. So Jansen was able to get some contact there, but couldn't put it well enough in play or well enough foul to keep the at bat alive. That'll bring up, up Stephanie Ballmer, who will be hitting in the seventh spot today. Ballmer made a great attempt at trying to stop that first run from scoring in the second inning. And that's where we can see a little bit of the, the dirt from the infield on her shirt as she laid it all out. Unfortunately, as we were mentioning, game of inches, missed it by just a few, which allowed the runner for third to advance home. Bomber takes ball one right here. And outside will take ball two as well. Steph Bomber would love to see her get on track. A little frustration last night in the eight inning loss to the Sharks. And that one taken for strike one. She's got Lily Keister behind her in the on deck circle as we're seeing the six, seven, and eight hitters here in the bottom of the second. The 2-1 with Ballmer hoping to get on base today. Looks for a bunt and pulls it back, but not in time. Or just inside the zone will be the call from the umpire. And I think that once again is kind of the view bias from up here in the booth. It looked like a little bit outside, but again, we can't really tell from the plate. 
2-2 here to Balmer. Balmer's going to get under that one. And that will be a routine flyout that is tracked down by Smith. So two outs here in the bottom of the second. As we are mentioning, Kalen Ellard has been having a great start so far, making quick work of the Spartans. And to try to keep the inning alive now will be Keister. Just to finish up on Balmer, she was 0 for 4 last night, struck out twice. And a tough start for her here today. Lots of softball still ahead, though, so plenty of time for her to turn things around in the batter's box. And the good news as well, exactly as you were saying, there is a lot to be played, and not just the seven innings today, but the seven innings afterwards because of the doubleheader. So once the game one finishes, you really should stick around because that is not going to be all she wrote for the series. We still have one more game to go afterwards here to complete the three-game weekend stretch. That one's going to be taken just outside. And so it's a good job by Keister here to get ahead in the count, two and one. Now with two outs, trying to get on base for the Spartans. On deck is Allie Perkins, Avery Perkins. That one's going to be taken outside for ball three. And Taylor, you mentioned about this being a doubleheader, and that's kind of the order of the day for the Spartans going forward because next week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, there are doubleheaders scheduled for UT all here at home. So get used to it for what will be four dates in a row. That one will be fouled away by Keister. But, yeah, doubleheaders always give you a chance to have to look at, hey, maybe if a player is getting tired, I have to make a change in the second game in the field or at the plate and allows you to react a little bit more immediately when it comes to trying to get players in that are in form or maybe rotate some players who aren't doing as well. The 3-2 will be grouted away by Keister doing a good job to try to raise the pitch count early on. Entering the at-bat, Ellard only 27 pitches, nearly with two innings complete. Kate Ellard, a grad student, five foot ten, previously attended UMass Lowell, and now a long way from there, from the northeast all the way down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where Nova Southeastern is based. As you see, Keister with a base hit. Keister was able to take the payoff pitch and get it right over the shortstop and third baseman, base player, and will be able to keep the inning alive for Avery Perkins. Avery Perkins, the right fielder for the Spartans, hitting in the number nine position here as we're in the home half of the second inning. And this will get us through the order as Mariah Galhouse, our starting pitcher in the on-deck circle, hoping to get her second at-bat of the day before this inning is over. Two outs, however, so it's Ellard going head-to-head -head with Perkins to see if this will end the second or if things will continue for the Spartans who have a runner on first. So the 0-1 here to Perkins. That one's going to be taken for strike two. One more pitch needed to potentially end the inning and leave one Spartan runner stranded. Checks the wrist, and here we go. That one's going to be fouled behind, so the at-bat will continue. And that is a good job by Perkins to stay alive. As you were mentioning, Gallhouse on deck. I know for a fact that Gallhouse would love a chance with a runner on base and potentially in scoring position, as she's been able to generate a lot of offense for the Spartans, including that hit in the first inning. That one's going to be taken outside the throw, and it's going to be a successful stolen base for Keister. Nice job by Lily on the base path there. Got just enough of a jump. And it changes the complexion just a little bit. Although keep in mind that Perkins is still behind in the count one and two. One and two, a few pitches to play with here for Ellard. That one's going to be grounded to third. The play from Williams will retire the side. One runner stranded on one hit. And that'll end the second inning. The Spartans trail by one after the Sharks get on the board. 
We'll be right back for inning number three of game number one. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. So we are ready to get the third inning underway here at the Moly Family Stadium. A beautiful Saturday, I'll say afternoon now as it is 12.30. Gallhouse back in the circle for a third inning of work. Has had a solid start so far, but one run conceded off two unfortunate hits. Trying to get a good start here and Will with strike one. You know, there used to be the old expression about they had their Wheaties this morning, and it seems like these two teams really did come to play because we're only through two innings. Both teams have three hits already, and just a lot, little bit of a different look to this game than we saw last night. And the Spartans, for all intents and purposes, seem to be in the driver's seat of last night's game. As I mentioned before, they're up 2 to nothing through five innings, and this one here seems like it's anybody's ball game, and here we are seeing some offense from both obviously the sharks are the only one that have anything to show for it and the run column but sets up for a good good game one here a lot of wind by the way the american flag out in right center field really lapping in the wind quite a bit as you see the first out and a nice play there by the spartans defensively gallhouse is going to be able to get the strikeout but chevalier not able to corral it perfectly so she needs to just make that throw to first and does it very nicely. We see the experience there from the Spartans, number two. Very much in action there. And as you're mentioning, Chevalier has started a majority of the games in the Spartans' career and has been able to finish them as well. And apart from having to leave one of the games due to injury, there has rarely been any uh, time missed for her. She's been so consistent for the Spartans, and not just as a really solid catcher, but as a very consistent bat, a reason she's hitting in the four spot today. Well, and the Spartans with an opportunity here to kind of quiet the Sharks' bats, retiring that first batter and now challenged a little bit by the top of the order. And that was fouled away. And oh, Fantone just a step behind and can't make the catch. Good Sid job to chase it down, though. Wasn't an easy ball to keep up with. Sydney Legere, nonetheless, behind in the count now one and two. So Mariah Galhouse with an opportunity here for potentially her third strike out of the game. So the one two here to Legere. Taken outside for ball two. Legere actually did strike out to start off this game. Two two, that one is going to be popped up, and Balmer makes a very nice catch, looking making it look easy. Although that definitely isn't the easiest of plays to make. Whenever there is a weirdly popped fly, that can be sometimes hard to judge. But now there are two outs for the top of the third. Gallhouse could be able to try to retire the batters one two three, if she's able to retire Riley Langwell right here. That first pitch is going to be taken down low for ball one. Last night on the broadcast, I mentioned about this being a geographically diverse Sharks roster, and Riley Langwell is another example of that, of how head coach Julie LaMare really scoured the country for this 2022 roster. She's from Granger, Indiana, and she's 0-1 in this game and ahead in this count 2-0. and With that 2-0 lead, hoping to generate some offense here for the Sharks. And that one's going to be taken for strike one. Almost squared up for a bunt, but pulled it back. 
Sharks will still lead 1-0 now with the 2-1 count. The 2-1 here from Gallhouse. And that one's going to be fouled off herself. And that's always that always stings when uh when you hit the ball and then it curls right back off your leg. Yeah, she'll shake that one off. A important at bat here, two and two and two outs, and wanting to keep things alive. And that one will be flied straight to Keister, who will retire the side with a simple catch. It's a one-two-three inning for the Spartans as Gullhouse makes good work of the nine, one, and two batters for the Sharks. We'll be right back as the Spartans will get ready for the bottom of the third on Sunshine State Conference Network and Tampa Spartans TV. Nice to have a little bit easier. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. Bottom of the third here. It's the pitcher versus pitcher matchup again. Mariah Gallhouse up for her second at bat. Having to face off gets Ellard in the circle. And yeah, she led this game off with a single. And we've talked on prior broadcasts, and it's always worth repeating what a dangerous hitter Mariah Gallhouse is, as I had said in the top of the first 327 average coming into today's game. Gallhouse able to take the first ball right here. Lines it down the third base line, but it's just going to drift foul. So the count will drop to one and one. And it was a line drive like that that was able to get Gallhouse on base, except it landed squarely down the middle and in play for a nice hit. Gallhouse is going to be a little disappointed that it couldn't stay fair, but still has time in the at-bat to try to continue to go. Technically, she's now tied for the team lead if you update the stats. She and Corinne Miner each have 19 hits this season. And with Miner not able to get on base last time, I know the Gauls might want to say, hey, let me get 20 and take the lead in that race. So the two on one count here for Gallhouse. Eller doing a good job in the circle to try to deal with one of the Spartans' most prolific hitters. That one's taken low once again. It's going to be a 3 1 count. And one thing for Gallhouse as well. Gullhouse might want to try to get ahead in that hit race, but a walk works too because you get on base and you're going to be able to set up Fantone, who's on deck, with a good opportunity with zero outs. Ellard looking at the wrist and fires. Gullhouse going to line it into the gap, but it's going to be very well tracked down by Langwell. A good running play to retire the first out. Yeah, nice job out there defensively by Riley Langwell. That ball had the potential to drop into no man's land. And Langwell able to close on it in time. And that was definitely not an easy fielded ball. Sometimes you mentioned there are balls that look like routine flyouts they have to track. No, that one was definitely nowhere close to routine. Yeah, to really put the Jets on. Fantone is going to fly right out to center. It was a good hit, but Sidney Legere is able to shrug it off and make it look easy to track it down and get the second out right away. Yeah, you so, took the words right out of my mouth. She made it look easy, and, and th those should be routine outs for a center fielder with the ball hit right to her. And so we'll see if Corinne Miner can keep things alive here for UT in the bottom of the third, her team down one to nothing. It's the OO count for Miner. That one's going to be taken inside for strike one. Corinne Miner flew out to right field in the first. That one will be fouled away, so now Miner down 0-2. The Spartans could once again be staring down the barrel of a 1-2-3 inning with no offense generated. 
The pitching doing well so far for both teams. And Ellard in the circle, looking to have a pretty much flawless inning for the most part. The 0-2 right here. That one's going to be flied. If it stays fair, it won't. It'll land just in the bullpen. And there was a good attempt on the play by Ali Janowick to try to track it down. But she just has to watch in vain as it falls right behind the fence. You can make a good diving play. You can try to stop it from going into the dugout. But a fence is the one thing that will stop you from getting that third out. So we'll go back to 0-2 one more time. Ellard to Miner. Taken outside for ball one. A good eye from Kern Miner to stay alive here. Ellard has a few pitches to work with from the circle. Meaning that Miner has to be careful for any more bait ones or any breaking ones that are meant to try to retire batters. The one two. That's gonna be taken up high. It counts now two and two. Yeah, good job by Corinne Miner to battle back from what was an 0-2 count and now even. So with the two two right here for Miner. That's gonna be taken inside. Nova Southeastern fans felt that was a strike. It was close. But it looked just a tiny bit inside. And now it's going to be a full count with two outs. A little bit more pressure for Ellard now in the circle. Here comes the payoff pitch. Quite a gap between second and short, by the way, defensively for the Sharks, although that one's way to the outfield. Yeah. The infield shift, no effect there, as Miner's going to line it to center field, just like Fantone did. And with that, the side is going to be retired after Legere tracks it down. Three batters up and three down for the Spartans. It's a nice one, two, three inning on both sides of the ball. We'll be back for the top of the fourth. The Sharks still lead one nothing. Autumn was not. It's not about any one thing. It's about how everything comes together, how it all connects. People, ideas, resources, community, everything. Quality of life services. That's what we do. Sodexo. We'll do it really fast. So we are back for the top of the fourth inning here at Namoli Family Stadium. We are still in game one of an exciting doubleheader to finish off a three-game series between the Tampa Spartans and Nova Southeastern Sharks. Last night, the Sharks won an extra innings 3-2 and so far lead 1-0. to zero. That one's going to be taken for strike one. And no one count to open up the top of the fourth here. Tia Williams facing off against Gullhouse in the circle. The 0 one here. That's going to be taken just outside for ball one. And you'll recall that back in the first inning, Williams beat out an infield single. So she's one for one so far in this game. Showing bunt there and it goes foul. And Gullhouse really able to deal with that well. Williams had tried to square with a bunt and yeah, just fouled behind. And I'd say Williams is the exact type of batter you're worried about. Someone who can get on base often, a really solid hitter, and with the speed that allows her just to drop a bunt and get on a lot of the time too. That's going to be grounded to second and a simple play there by Russo to retire Williams. That time it grounded short enough and fast enough so that even Williams couldn't beat it out. But you know, for the young kids that are watching, that's why you run those out. There's always a chance of an error defensively, and you saw Williams running it out even though she knew that, as you mentioned, Taylor, it should have been a routine ground out, which it was, but you still got to run those out anyways. That one will be taken for strike one right here as Ali Janowick is hoping to have a successful at bat this time around. Janowick was able to get a double last time. That's fouled away, so now it's going to be an 0-2 count with one away. 
Gallhouse just checking in with Chevalier real quick. Looked like a play that might have ricocheted off Chevalier, so she was just checking in. Hey, you're all good? Yeah, I'm all good. Let's get ready and back to the action. As Gallhouse gets back to the circle now. And home plate umpire Brian Serafin as well. Just making sure that everything's good before we resume. And now Gallhouse ready with the 0-2. The 0-2, it's going to be Fly to Russo, who makes a nice grab to retire the second out. So Morris comes back into the batter's box here. Interestingly, it looked like Chevalier just showed the inside of her elbow to the home plate umpire, so curious as to if that's what might have gotten nicked a couple minutes ago. And it's also one of the few places that you don't have the catcher's gear on. So a little bit unfortunate with that. Yo one count here to open up with two outs. That one's going to be taken down low for ball one. So the 1-1 one -one here for Morris, who was able to get a sacrifice last time. There's strike two. After that one is fouled directly into the dirt. Got another chance for a 1-2-3 inning for the Spartans, that the Sharks will be hoping to not suffer that again. But a 1-2 here in the circle from Gullhouse. And gets her looking with the off speed. The side is retired. 1-2-3. And the Spartans are ready to go up next. And that is going to be the third strikeout from, for Gullhouse so far. We'll be right back for the bottom of the fourth. In NCAA Division II, student athletes leave a lasting impression on their communities. That's because Division II student athletes want to make a difference and truly be part of their surrounding communities. Through community engagement, thousands of student athletes from various backgrounds interact with community members who view them as role models. This interaction leaves a positive and perhaps even life-changing impression on all those involved. In Division II, we rise to the opportunity and make community engagement ours. Being a champion takes more than skill more than endless drills, more than using your head. Being a champion takes the heart to give it your all, the agility to thrive from any angle, and the relentless drive to be the best. Welcome to Division Two, where the pursuit is yours to create. And the question isn't, can you do it? It's will you. We are ready for the bottom of the fourth. Major League Baseball may be locked out, but you know what isn't? This exciting ball game between the Sharks and Spartans. They currently lead 1-0 on the road, hoping to get game two of the series and already win the, the three-game series between the teams. But it's not a playoff series. It's a regular season series, so that third game is happening no matter what. And with the pretty warm temperatures, you mentioned it was 83 earlier at the Moly Fam here at the Namoli Family Stadium. Some of them might be saying, you know what? Maybe not having to play another seven innings might not be terrible, although that is just in jest. These two teams are extremely competitive, show so much effort, I know they'll be ready to go once game one wraps up. Here's the first pitch at the bottom of the fourth, taken for ball one. And by the way, Taylor, our temperature is now up to 85 degrees, and for those that might not be aware, this isn't, you mentioned the MLB lockout and the season not getting underway. As scheduled, we are well into college softball season. The Spartans come into this game 11-6. and six. So by the time today is done, they're going to have already played 19 games. And then I mentioned doubleheaders next week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And same thing for Nova Southeastern. They come in having already played 18 games and 11-7 and one-loss record. So it might, on the calendar, only be March 5. But college softball season has been underway for a while now. And the Spartans actually had their first game of the season on February 5. So we're already a month in, and as I mentioned, 17 games for UT. That one is going to be lined to the outfield there. And that will be tracked down very well by Sidney Legere. So that will be disappointing for Chevalier, who got a good contact, but isn't able to get down. 
good outfield play by the Sharks to limit what could be extra base hits or even more for the Spartans. Yeah, we've seen a couple putouts from Sidney Legere and then as well in right field by Riley Langwell. So good play from the Sharks outfielders so far in this game. So with one out, it brings up Alexa Russo, who will take that one high for ball one. Russo flew out to foul territory on the left field side back in the first inning. So the 1-0 count here, Russo hoping to get on base. That one's going to be taken well into the dirt for ball two. And so far, despite a few pitches in the dirt and getting down in the count, Ellard has been perfect when it comes to not allowing a single walk from the circle so far. However, Ellard also hasn't been able to record a strikeout yet. That being said, only three hits allowed in three and a third is a pretty good start indeed. And with that, is able to get a strike, and the count goes to two and one. So already being able to fight back in the circle in this at bat. The 2-1 to Russo. Russo is going to foul this off, and it will be cleanly caught by Janowick. And there are now two outs in the bottom of the fourth. If it wasn't for those 85-degree temperatures, I would say that the Sharks haven't really had to break a sweat too much defensively. A lot of these balls are being hit right to them, and they're playing good softball and making the putouts as they come to them. The ball just seems to be finding the glove of both the infielders and the, and the outfielders. And that one's going to be fouled away. Ooh, couldn't come up with a catch. Really good effort there from Chanwick to try to track it down. But that would be just a foul ball for strike one. And I think exactly that. Whenever you're in the circle and your fielders are doing a lot of good work and making sure that there aren't any errors, aren't any balls in play that can turn into good base hits, that's where you can definitely thank him, and you might get him maybe a little bit extra pizza, a little bit extra ice cream uh, after the game, just as a shi uh, sign of thanks. That one's going to be taken here for strike two, and so already Emily Jansen is going to be down 0-2 with two outs. We could be back-to-back -back for the, for uh, a fourth side in a row, going 1-2-3, 1-2-3, 1-2-3, 1-2-3, 1-2-3. The 0-2. Going to be taken outside for ball one. Yeah, that one was way outside, and Kate Ellard, as you mentioned, has otherwise been right on target. As you see her check the dugout, check the wristband, and get ready here with the 1-2. And that one's going to be flown to left field, and with that, it's out number three after a 1-2-3 inning. Four innings have been played so far, and it's still one nothing for the Sharks. And over the last two innings, we haven't seen a single hit. So it's been a great display from the circle for both teams. Will it continue in the fifth? We'll find out in just a minute. We'll be right back on the Sunshine State Conference Network and Tampa Spartans TV. Sharks lead 1-0. This is the University of Tampa. UT students travel from across the nation and around the globe to join a dynamic learning community. There are 150 academic programs, continuing studies for non-traditional students, and a highly ranked graduate school. Academic opportunities are extensive and rigorous, but this mid-sized residential campus retains a welcoming feel. With a student-faculty ratio of 16 to 1, students benefit from direct interaction with expert faculty, a faculty that is passionate about teaching and mentoring. Top of the fifth right here, the Spartans trail by one, but it's been an incredibly close game so far, and Gall's House has had a pretty good night from the circle, Bruce. Yeah, we've talked a lot about Kate Ellard and what she's done for the Sharks. As you see, the first pitch there from Gall House 0-1 to the batter Madison Fine, but you know Galhaus. Let's not overlook the game is only one to nothing, and both teams have three hits. As you see that one chopped to Russo, and over to Emily Jansen at first for out number one. Galhaus is getting the job done. As they say, it's only one to nothing. Each team has three hits. She's gotten the job done. She's got four strikeouts, and so Mariah Galhaus just not getting maybe the attention that we've been giving to Kate Ellard on the Shark side. 
Gelhaus, 53 pitches so far in this game, 15 batters faced. So she's in this one to stay. I anticipate that she'll turn in a complete game. And the only question will remain who will be in the circle in game two for the Spartans. Will it be Corinne Miner who pitched last night? Or will we maybe see Mary Beth Feldman? So pitch number 55 for Gullhaus taken for ball one. A double check with the first base umpire. Well, actually, it's just a flex umpire because there are only two here. But also confirms the ball ruling. Pitch number 56 taken for strike two. And now a 1-2 count here. That's Haley Hendricks. Hendricks, the batter. She hit into a fielder's choice in the second inning. She's hitting out of the number seven position in the Sharks lineup. The one-two to Hendricks. It's going to be taken low for ball two. And yeah, I think Hendricks was attempting a sacrifice in her first at bat, but it was a good play by Gallhaus to read it and fire to second to prevent the sacrifice from advancing the runner. That one's grounded straight to Gallhaus, who very calmly makes the play from the circle. So the one-three will be how that scored. And there's now two outs. One other comment about Galhaus, you know, we've talked about this on previous broadcasts. The Spartans pitchers really don't take a lot of time in between pitches. We see a lot of the visitors who check with the dugout, they check with the wristband, they get the signals from the catcher. Galhaus has nice cadence to, as you see, the inning retired there. Galhaus, very efficient that half inning and gets it done with three up and three down. Yeah, and I think that's a testament to how efficient she is. I mean, we weren't even able to finish talking about how efficient she was, and she already retired the final batter. We'll be right back with the bottom of the fifth. The Spartans looking to get back into the game after a 1-2-3 inning in the circle from Gallhouse. Welcome to the University of Tampa. My name is Tucker Whitman, and I'm a junior marketing major here at UT. Today we're going to look at some of the highlights of our beautiful Riverside campus here in downtown Tampa. We'll start at Plan Hall. This historic building was opened in 1891 as the Tampa Bay Hotel and now serves as the main academic building here at UT with four floors of classrooms as well as faculty and administrative offices. Next up, the Vaughn Center, the hub of campus life and activities. This multi-purpose building includes the campus bookstore, our primary cafeteria plus an additional food court, a theater, as well as offices and meeting rooms for student organizations. The Vaughn Center is also one of UT's residence halls, providing five floors of student rooms. Morsani Hall is another residence hall here at UT. In addition to housing approximately 450 students, this building offers another selection of eateries as well as a small grocery store. Now let's check out the Sykes College of Business. This academic building houses classrooms and faculty. So here we go, bottom of the fifth underway. Stephanie Balmer will lead off for the Spartans. That one's going to be taken just high for ball one. Steph Ballmer, we're seeing the seven, eight, and nine hitters here in the home half of the fifth. Ballmer, Keister, and Perkins. Ballmer 0 for 1, flew out to left field in the second inning. Ballmer will take that inside, but it is strike one right on the edge of the zone. And Ballmer, as we mentioned, is having a little bit of a hitting slump and I know she's going to want to try to spark some offense here and get that hitting slump done and dusted. That one's going to be popped foul, and that will just stay foul enough to land into the home bullpen. Yeah, if there's any silver lining to a hitting slump, you know, at least you're putting the bat on the ball. If you're in a hitting slump and it's just overloaded with strikeouts, then there's some issues there, but it's a matter of time before Steph breaks out of that slump. We saw her first at bat lead to a very nice fly out. It's going to be a bloop. Will it drop? Nope. A good job by Langwell to track it down to keep the slump going. Ballmer going to be a little bit disappointed there. But another ball in play, meaning there is progress being made on that front. Yeah, exactly. Exactly my thoughts. It's not, it's not striking out. And we saw the pitch that she fouled off down the left field side. Had a little bit of distance to it. That one that was in play and routine for the right fielder. But... Ballmer will get another chance, presumably in this game, to get back in the hit column. Keister up now and takes ball one. Keister's one for one, singled in the second, and has got to have a little bit of confidence as a result. Obviously, some incentive here as her team needs a runner on base as 
time slowly becomes a factor, bottom of the fifth. And we'll be able to do just that, getting on base. It's not going to be fielded cleanly enough by Burke, who gets a glove on it, but can't get all of the glove on it as it rolls into the outfield for a single with one away. Yeah, I think that Samantha Burke a little disappointed that she wasn't able to field that one, and that might be the little bit of an opening that the Spartans need to start to build some momentum. And this time it's going to be a bunt that is dropped, and the play is going to be made at first. So Perkins does the job with the sacrifice, and that will be able to bring up Maria Gallhouse with a runner in scoring position. And I think that's what Gallhouse has been waiting for, a chance to try to bring a runner home. We saw Gallhouse in the first inning as the leadoff batter make a beautiful hit into the outfield, and that's the type of play that will be able to send Keister home. And Galhouse would love to help her own cause here. And there's going to be a line to the left, but out of play. Strike one. Those are the kind of balls, Taylor, that I'm talking about with someone like Balmer, who's in a little bit of a slump. If you're making contact with the ball like that, it's just really a game of inches, as I talked about at the beginning of the broadcast, that eventually one of those is going to go fair, and you'll see Balmer reach base eventually, but... A little bit of a conference here in the circle as head coach Julie Lemaire for the Sharks comes out to talk to her pitcher, Kate Ellard. And meanwhile, the Spartans have a quick little conference over near third base as Leslie Cantor talks to Lily Keister, who is the Spartans' base runner at second, and the current hitter, Mariah Galhouse, as well as listening in on it as Lauren Fantone as she's on deck Hoping to get an opportunity to bat here with her team trailing one to nothing. So after the conference, potentially going over some strategies for Ellard in the circle. Now the 0-1 will be played here to Gallhouse. Gallhouse gonna ground it over the pitcher. The Spartans can tie it up. And it will. The throw in home would not be taken and not in time. And Gallhouse gets the job done. An RBI single up the middle. And that one just bounced right over Ellard's head. Yeah, well-placed ball. And let's not overlook the job on the base pass, the running by Lily Keister, because we saw a little bit of hesitation by the center fielder, Legere, and there might have been at least an opportunity had she thrown it quicker and decided otherwise. And I think that was the difference that allows the Spartans to tie this game up. Fantone going to drive it up the middle as well, and that will put two runners on for Curran Miner to step up with two outs. Exact same place, hit it to the exact same place that we saw Galhouse. And so you have to wonder if maybe the conference at third base that Leslie Cantor had was, this seems like an, an opening here, let's try to hit it straight to second base and two batters in a row. And as a result, UT has not only tied the game, but now runners on first and second. And are we gonna get a pitching change here? Because yeah. head coach Julie Lemaire for Nova Southeastern is talking to home plate umpire Brian Serafin. And in fact, yeah, it looks like Kate, Kate Ellard is going to surrender the ball. And yeah, instead, gonna we're going to see Emily Hess, who we saw last night. Yeah, it's a call to the pen, and Hess will be back on the mount, or in the circle. Hess had a good start last time out for the Sharks, only conceding two runs early in the game. And apart from that, was able to pitch uh, six complete innings of really solid work. And they're hoping that. She can help quiet the situation here with two runners on and two outs. It's interesting timing, too, because with two outs, you might say, I want to give the benefit of the doubt to my pitcher. I don't want to take away from her confidence. Let's get out of this inning. But at the same time, I think Julie Lemaire is saying, let's shut down the Spartans right away and close the door while it is only tied one-to-one, -one, knowing that UT has runners on first and second. So let's get a fresh arm in there and get Emily Hess, who's rested after you mentioned pitching last night, and give Kate Ellard a big thank you, send her to the dugout, and try to get out of this fifth inning before the Spartans can do any more damage. And I'm sure, Taylor, that a lot of it has to do with the fact that the hitter is Corinne Miner, who, as we've talked about quite a bit, is always dangerous with the bat. She's the number three hitter, and she's 0 for 2, which, you know, some people would argue that means that she's due here. So let's see if Emily Hess can change the script for the Sharks. 
The old pitch taken in the dirt. Ball one. And I think exactly that, Bruce. And with two outs as well, there had been two chances for Ellard to try to retire the side. But instead it was two hits for the Spartans. And it's now allowed the game to be tied at 1-1. But here's the 1-0 to Curran Miner. Miner's going to take that one. Just a little too inside for ball two. A big opening here for Corinne Miner. And UT really with an opportunity that they need to take advantage of because Nova Southeastern otherwise has not given them much today. And that one is going to be fouled back. And that one hit the tarp that protects the fans from any very fast foul balls. So that one will just be strike one, two and one count now. 2-1 here for Curran Miner. Two outs here and a chance to try to give the Spartans a lead. The go-ahead runner on second. There's going to be a ball that's flown to center field. And the side is retired. The Sharks escaped and stopped the bleeding. But the Spartans, unlike the Sharks, smelled the blood in the water this time and were able to tie the game up. The top of the six is up next. It is a 1-1 game between the Spartans and Sharks. We'll be right back. What have we here? Another random school of fish. Watch as they mimic each other's every move. Even their own mothers can't tell these fish apart. In this school, there is no room for individualism. These fish live in fear. This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. And we are back for the top of the sixth inning here in the Moley Family Stadium. It has been an exciting game one of a doubleheader. The Spartans in the bottom half of the fifth were able to finally bring a runner home and get the game tied. Now the pressure will once again be in the circle for Gallhouse entering her sixth inning of work, having pitched only 58 pitches in the first five. So a good job by her so far. And now we'll have to face Alexis Smith to open up. The sixth, that one's going to be taken for strike one. And we want to thank you for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. This is game one of a scheduled doubleheader between the Spartans and the Nova Southeastern Sharks. And that one's going to be fouled behind for strike two. Now a chance for the 0-2 count to retire the first batter for Gallhouse. And, ooh, just a little bit too outside there. And not even Chevalier can get her glove on it. So the count will fall to one and two. One thing that has not changed from last night's game is the stands are packed again. Great to see the fan turnout here on campus this Saturday afternoon. As you see, a little check swing there that rolls foul. And as we mentioned last night, lots of people made the quote-unquote short four-hour drive northwest from down in Fort Lauderdale to come and root on the Sharks, but lots of Spartans fans inside the Namoli Family Stadium as well today. And that one will be a simple grounder to Emily Jansen, who's able to pick it up and just jog over the first to retire and get the first out. And that brings us back to the top of the Sharks order, as we're going to see Sydney Legere, who is 0 for 2 in this game. She's their center fielder. Legere fouls it out of play. I know Legere will be hoping to try to get on base this time and generate a little offense, and has a little time to do so with one out. Is down 0-1 in the count. Yeah, we've seen her very active on the score sheet defensively in this game, and you're right, she'd love to contribute with the bat now. The 0-1 to Legere. That one's going to be taken for strike two. Miss out the chance to say it's a 1-1 count with one out with number one at the plate in a 1-1 ball game and the first half of the sixth inning. But now the 0-2 to Legere, a chance for Gallhouse to get another strikeout. 
That's going to be low, and it'll bring us to a one and two count. Specifically, Sydney Legere with four putouts in this game. So great stuff in the field. One, two. And we'll finally be able to do it with the bat. Fantone makes a good play in the outfield to make sure it doesn't get any further. But it's just a little bit too shallow for her. And that finally gets Legera hit. Sharks fourth of the day. And of course that's what you want from your leadoff hitter is getting on base. And it sets up now for Riley Langwell. She's 0 for 2. And would love to repeat what she just saw her teammate do ahead of her and get into the hit column. So that one is ball one right here. And exactly that. And also there is going to be the danger of Legere potentially trying to steal a base. Legere taking some good leads as that one is going to be taken for one and one. Sydney Legere, you're right. She is a base stealing threat. She's been successful in 10 of 11 attempts so far this season. Here's the 1-1. One, one. Legere goes to throw to second. Not in time. So that'll be stolen base number 11. And that's just, I think, unfortunate on the part for Chevalier because she got the throw up in time. And the tag, I think, was just one second late. But it's always tricky to stop stolen bases Yeah, I here. think that was a combination of I did keep an eye on Legere. She got a very timely jump and I think Chevalier just hesitated just enough with the throw that made the difference in the call down at second base and it's the right call Chevalier I think just needed to be a little bit quicker getting that out of her glove so now it's going to be a one and two count here that's going to be grounded to short and a simple play at first to get the second out a good read by Balmer there and the runner is stuck at second and Tia Williams now step up to plate. And we were mentioning that there are some Nova Southeastern fans. I noticed a few fans with uh, Williams shirts in the crowd. Have to assume that's her family here to cheer her on, making the short four-hour drive. But Williams a chance to try to give the Sharks the lead here. The two outs. That one's going to be taken for strike one. Getting back to that second out, Steph Ballmer did a nice job before she threw so quickly over to first. Checking second to see if the runner was off far enough to make a play there. But that time he's going to get into the outfield. Keister's throw home. Oh, almost. Wow. And so Williams able to get the Sharks fans really excited with a hit into the outfield. And I will say, it was going to send the runner home, but what a play from Keister to fire it home to get it maybe within a few steps of a tag. I mean, that definitely shouldn't have been a play at the plate, but if it was just maybe a tiny bit earlier and a little more fieldable, that probably would have been a gun down at the plate. Well, and from the category of give him an E for effort, not only Keister with the attempt for the throw to home, but Chevalier jumping up right away and seeing if there was an opportunity at second. So, you know, the Spartans are mentally aware of what needs to be done. It's just that game of inches that I talked about at the beginning of the broadcast. And missing out on a chance to get out of the inning by a few inches. And now it'll bring the Sharks back to a 2-1 lead here in top of the sixth. A 2-0 count here. And Gullhouse doing well from the circle. And I know she's definitely going to be disappointed to have those two plays be the ones that send runs home. Now is able to get a strike. 2-1 count here for Ali Janowick. Janowick, of course, a graduate from Clarksburg, Maryland. That's going to be grounded to short, and Balmer will make the play at first to end the inning. The Sharks are able to take the lead once again, and disappointingly for the Spartans, their work they did in the bottom half of the fifth is undone partially, and they're going to have to be playing from behind once again, entering the bottom of the sixth. We'll be right back in the Sunshine State Conference Network and Tampa Spartans TV. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCAA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, 
and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. So we are back for the top of the or bottom of the sixth. The Spartans will have a chance to try to get back on the scoreboard. And Bruce, we had a pretty eventful top half of the inning. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, in that top of the sixth, the Spartans were in the same place that the Sharks were in the previous half inning, insofar as there were two outs, and that could have been a chance for Leslie Cantor to say, I'm going to do what Julie Lemaire did, and I'm going to change pitchers, and instead she stuck with Mariah Galhouse. I'm not saying it was the right or the wrong move, but just interesting to see two different coaching philosophies. As Cantor said, I'm sticking with Galhouse, unlike the pitching change that we saw for the Sharks, which resulted in the starter, Kate Ellard, being taken out, and they go with Emily Hess, who you currently see out there in the circle right now. So here's the 0-1, as Hess leads out here well, and that's going to be fouled away by Chevalier, down 0-2 in the count now. Hess was starting last night in Game 1 of the series, and did a pretty good job throughout six innings. And now in the circle, trying to help close out what would be a very close win for the Sharks, although there's still another inning to play after this. The 0-2 here to Chevalier. That's going to be taken high, but for ball one. Yeah, Hess started last night, and then we eventually saw Ashley Connor, who we would guess, we would guess, might be the Sharks starter in game two of today's doubleheader. Now a 1-2 here to Chevalier. That's going to be fouled behind. So the count will stay one and two. Yeah, that one went off the screen. No play there for the catcher. So Chevalier able to stay alive. Chevalier, one of two so far, was able to get a hit in her first at bat. That one's fouled away, so the at bat will continue. So now a 1-2 count here. Chevalier hoping to stay alive. Hess in the circle trying to get a first out at the bottom of the sixth. Chevalier is going to ground it to short. Played well. Throw is going to be in time to retire the first out of the inning. It's a, a close call, though. It's the right call by the umpire, but good hustle by Lexi Chevalier running that one out. And that's why you run him out. You never know whether one time you'll actually beat it. So Chevalier is able to get close, but not close enough. That leaves the bases empty for Alexa Russo, who is 0 of 2 in today's ballgame. That's going to be taken for strike one. Russo, the number five hitter. So we're still going to see Emily Jansen this half inning. She's on deck right now. So now it's going to be the 0-1 to Russo. Swing and a miss. Russo now down 0-2 in the count with one out. Russo swinging at the fences on that one, trying to tie the game up with one swing at the bat. That's something I wouldn't advise doing at Namoli Family Stadium because it's not a very home run friendly ballpark. Big walls that are also pretty far back. Now the 0-2 is going to be taken outside by Russo. A good eye to make sure she doesn't go down in three pitches. Hess will be a little bit disappointed, but still leads from the circle. The one-two from Russo. Russo fouls it away. And the at-bat stays alive. That's going to be fouled away once again. So good job to stay alive by Russo. Yeah, Russo hanging in there. She knows that she's 0 for 2, trying not to let that get to her. As I mentioned, don't worry about tying it up with the one swing of the bat. Just put the bat on the ball and 
There's a huge gap between the second base player and the shortstop if she can exploit that. Not able to do it, unfortunately, for her as the grounder that is up the middle lands right to Hess, who's able to make a simple play at first, and now there are two outs for the bottom of the sixth. As you were mentioning, EJ Jansen is going to get a chance this inning and is up here with two outs and no one on. And I'll tell you what a difference here between five foot three Emily Hess and six foot zero Emily Jansen cutting a much more imposing figure at the plate. Jansen's going to ground it to short. A good effort, but just trips right there. The good news for Burke is that she's up and all good, but that's going to be a nice error that'll benefit Tampa and get Jansen to first. And now it's a ground ball right to her, and I think she might have misread the ball just slightly as it went a little bit more to her right than she expected, causing herself to trip over as she had to reach down to the right while moving left to pick it up. But it doesn't go into the outfield, so no risk of any extra bases on that play. And Leslie Cantor talking to home plate umpire Brian Serafin, which would indicate that we're going to have a change in the lineup here. Obviously, we're going to get a change in the batting. Well, no, it looks like we're going to have a, a pinch runner, which is interesting because I pointed this out pregame before we went on the air. Mackenzie Allen is going into pinch run at first base and she's got a huge brace on her right knee yeah. and in fact we are going to get a pinch hitter after all so they're going to have Siegel. Siegel bat now instead of Balmer so Siegel will be up here with two outs and two substitutions there to try to generate some further offense Mackenzie Allen was caught stealing on her only stolen base attempt this season. And Siegel's going to do the job, gets it into the outfield. And the pinch runner's going to make it to third in time. Tell you what, though, I was a little nervous on that relay because going to third, it looked like the throw was, was on track to maybe get there in time. And maybe it is that brace that prevented from Allen from getting in there sooner. Fortunately for the Spartans, she is safe. And that sets up nicely now for Lily Keister with a runner at third base. And keep in mind, of course, there are two outs. Keister is two for two in this game. So some optimism here for the home team. Keister has been consistent with getting some hits so far. So they're definitely going to be excited to have her up with two runners on. The tying run at third, a go-ahead run, which would be hard to score at first. As Keister takes ball one right here. So a little bit of pressure in the circle for Hess. And it was funny, we saw Hess's second inning in the last game be where she conceded her uh, only two runs. And she's technically in the second inning. She's worked this time. That's going to be fouled away. Count falls to one and one. You think back to those changes that Leslie Cantor made. She's going to go over and thank Abby Siegel for making her look good. Getting on base in the spot where Steph Ballmer had been unsuccessful. 0 for 4 last night, 0 for 2 today. And so she makes the right change as Siegel keeps things alive here in the bottom of the sixth. Now one's going to be taken outside for ball two. And while uh, Morris made the throw to third just to keep that runner in check, Siegel says, thank you very much. I'll gladly take second base and puts a second runner in scoring position. So far tonight in runners in scoring position, Tampa is only 1 for 4. They're hoping to be 2 for 5 here. The 2 1 count for Siegel. Fouled away again, so the count will fall to 2 and 2. Two runners on, two balls, two strikes, and two outs. A chance in the circle for Hess to try to get out of what would be a really difficult jam to try to enter the top of the seventh, maintaining a one run lead. Siegel wanting to get home to be that go ahead run, and Keister wanting to be the person to drive them in. There's going to be a fly to left field and it's caught cleanly to end the inning. The Spartans strand two down one, which is painful for them, but joyous for the Sharks, as they'll enter at the top of the seventh, still leading by one run. We'll be right back on Tampa Spartan CV. It's not about any one thing. It's about how everything comes together, how it all connects. People, ideas, 
resources, community, everything. Quality of life services. That's what we do. Sodexo. What do you get when you take your favorite food and stuff it inside a pocket of homemade dough? Cooked perfectly until golden brown. It's a mouth-watering empanada from Mr. Empanada. No one makes a better empanada. Take Ted Webb's word for it. Almost as good as my mom used to make. Check out our website for a location near you. MrEmpanada.com As the music is playing, let's get down to business for top of the seventh. And the Spartans had a chance to take the lead, Bruce, but painfully taken away from them. And your thoughts on straining those runners? Yeah, that's been a problem. And last night they finished the game with nine runners left on base through the eight-inning loss. And here in this game, they've left seven runners on base. And particularly heartbreaking in that last half inning when they were both in scoring position. And that's going to be something that the Spartans need to clean up in a hurry because you see these close games that they're in. This one, 2-1. to one. And if you think of coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know, what would have been last night and what could have been this afternoon. And that one taken for strike two. Nova hasn't had as many problems leaving runners on base. Only two so far in the entire game. Morris down 0-2 to Gullhouse. That's going to be grounded to third, but well foul, out of play. Spartans have done their part in terms of being active with the bats. Seven hits so far, which is not able to bring home enough across the plate. That one's going to be grounded to Gallhouse. I minor. was reading the two as a one, so minor is that one's going to be foul. There's another chance right here. So, yeah, two plays in a row. This one looked like it had more of a chance, to be fair. But it was actually mishandled by Miner, so it's a good thing for her that it was foul. But this time, it will be put in play by Morris, who will advance to first. A good effort by Balmer, but can't pull it down to get the out. So runner will get on with no outs. Bringing up Madison Fine. Fine is uh, tied for the tallest player on the Sharks. As there will be a pinch runner at first. Sydney Swantick will come on to try to take another run and give Nova a two, a three-one lead. So far, Mariah Gallhouse, eighty-two pitches. Four strikeouts and only six hits allowed. However, currently losing 2-1 with two earned runs. Swantick is going to be able to advance to second off the sacrifice. So good work by Fine to lay down the bunt and bring a runner to second with now just one out. Yeah, the Sharks are just playing smart, fundamental softball. Moving the runners up. And only one out with an opportunity here to try to add to this lead what with a runner now at second base. So the runner on second, one out after the sacrifice. That first pitch is taken for ball one. So Haley Hendricks, who's 0 for 2 so far, would love to be the player to try to help expand the lead for the Sharks and put him up 3-1. Gallhouse is not going to be willing to let that happen. That pitch is going to be taken down low for ball two. Let's see if head coach Julie Lemaire gets aggressive, whether or not she sends Swantick trying to steal third. A runner on third with one out will open up the opportunity of potentially advancing on a deep fly ball. That time it's going to be taken for strike one, but so far Swantick just stays at second. They know that Chevalier has been very alert on any stolen base attempt. And it's easier to pick off someone at third than it is at second. 2-1 here. That's going to be taken for strike two. Gullhouse in the circle working ahead to get back into the count. 2-2 now with one out. And a chance to retire Hendricks with this pitch. 
right here. And meanwhile, I've got one eye on Lemaire and one eye on Swantec. Seeing if she gives her the green light. You always have to be careful, though, with giving a green light with one out, because if it's a quick fly to the infield, that can just be played very easily for a double play that completely ends the inning. So now, a 2-2 again after the foul ball. That one's going to be lined. Palmer can't bring it down all the way to Keister. Keister's throw home. Not in time, as it's again a few inches behind. Chevalier can't make the play, and the Sharks take a two-run lead. And now they lead 3-1 with a runner on second with one out. And we're going to get another change of some kind as head coach Julie Lemaire talking to home plate umpire Brian Serafin. And it looks like the Sharks are going to send up a pinch hitter in the person of Kirsten Shaw. And Kirsten Shaw with a 222 average through 11 games played this season. She does have four RBI. And so called upon here in the top of the seventh as her team has just extended its lead to three to one. And Tampa gonna want to stop the bleeding here, but the Sharks smell blood in the water now. And they're trying to expand it even more. The count will now go to one and one after a taken strike. And yeah, as we were mentioning Shaw, the sophomore out of Punta Gorda, Florida, and Charlotte High School has a chance here. That one's going to be taken as well for strike two. So now, a one-two count. Really important out here for Galhaus and the Spartans if they can put down Shaw. That one taken low for ball two. And that one's going to be taken for strike three. It's the off speed that lands in the zone. And strike out number five for Mariah Gallhouse. Yeah, that's a huge out right there. And changes the complexion of this top of the seventh. Spartans hoping to close it out now. The two outs there. Smith flashes a bunt but pulls it away for ball one. All of a sudden they're maybe not as bothered by there being a runner at second knowing that they're essentially one pitch. All it takes is a batted ball to end the inning. So that one is taken outside again. The infield ready to press in in case Smith does try to lay down a bunt here. 2-0 count now. That one's going to be taken for strike one, low and inside the zone. Two one here from Gallhouse. That one's going to be taken just high and away. So three and one. The batter on deck is Sidney Legere. It would take it back to the top of the order if Smith is able to get on base. The three one with two outs from Gallhouse. And it'll be ball four. So it'll be the first walk of the day for Gallhouse. Yeah, I was just going to say she picked a bad time to issue her first base on balls of the afternoon. As you see, Lexi Chevalier going out there to have a word with Galhaus, and now two aboard with two outs in the top of the seventh, and the Spartans trailing by two. And as you mentioned, it brings us back to the top of the order, and Sydney Legere is one for three in this game, including a hit in her most recent at-bat, which was in the last inning, top of the sixth. Legere will be hoping to do that again with a first pitch. Legere is just going to drop a bunt, and the side will be retired. The Spartans concede a run, and now last chance saloon is open once again as the Western battle reaches its final chapter of book one of the two book series we have today, the doubleheader. But the Sharks, one inning away from securing the victory. We'll be right back for the bottom of the seventh. Another ordinary day at UT.
Ooh, sometimes I get a good feeling that this is going to be an exciting inning. Well, hopefully for Spartans fans, they can generate some offense or else they'll be taking a loss in game one. Avery Perkins leads off for the Spartans here. Perkins was able to get a sacrifice in her last attempt, but apart from that, is 0-1 on the day. That one is almost a ground ball instead of a pitch as it goes well outside and in the dirt for ball one. Things have really heated up here and have not even referring to the fact that our temperature has increased. It's now 86 degrees outside, but the Spartans giving up one run in the top half of this and the previous inning to all of a sudden go from having tied up the game in the bottom of the fifth to now trailing 3-1. to one. And their backs to the wall here and what potentially could be the last at-bat of the game. We're seeing the 9-1-2 and two hitters this evening. This inning, Perkins, Galhouse, and Fantone. And there's going to be a drive deep to the gap. The outfield was playing in, and a run not going to be able to be making the play. And wow, on that play, it was just a hit that absolutely went far to center field. And we saw that Legere was just very much inside watching for any short ground balls or line drives. And it was then down to Langwell with the speed to actually get to the ball, but just couldn't make the secure enough catch. So it's going to be a double that now brings a potential tying run in Gullhouse to the plate. Yeah, you do have to credit Langwell, as you mentioned, for making the run all the way over from right field. And as much as she might appreciate the compliment, she's disappointed to have not been able to secure the catch and what ended up being center field, and the Spartans are thrilled as they get the leadoff hitter aboard with Avery Perkins at second base and Galhouse who's two for three in this game now with an opportunity to help her own cause as today's starting pitcher. Galhouse now going to ground it up the middle. It's going to be missed by Short and sold out will be an RBI single for Galhouse. The Spartans are within one with the middle bats getting ready to go. Curran Miner will get a chance to bat as a potential tying run while well, Gallhouse is on first as the actual tying run right now. It was scored as an error, but at the end of the day, it means that Gallhouse has reached base in three of her four at-bats, and that one she's thrilled because it also resulted in driving in the game's second run on the UT side of the scoreboard. So how quickly things can change, and now UT having a little conference as head coach Leslie Cantor wants to make sure that everybody's on the same page here and as also, the door has opened. We also get a call to the pen here for Nova Southeastern. They want to protect this lead, so they are bringing in Ashley Connor, who was able to secure a win late in the game last time. It was on Friday night, Connor came in, was able to pitch the final few innings and secure a win for Nova Southeastern, not allowing much Spartans offense to be had and being brought in here to try to secure a save opportunity with a runner on. 3-2 the score. Yeah, she'll be facing Lauren Fantone, who is one for three so far in this game. Fantone singled in the fifth. And so now we're going to see what is the pitcher that we thought would possibly start game two in Ashley Connor. She's the third pitcher of the game for the Sharks here in game one of the doubleheader. And so let's see how Connor does facing Lauren Fantone here in the bottom of the seventh with a Spartans runner at first base. Three to two lead and nobody out for UT. So now Fantone at the plate. Connor's first pitch goes outside for ball one. So high leverage situation in the circle for Ashley Connor. And Fantone, high leverage at bat as well. Fantone is going to be able to drop the bunt. The throw to first is made. And it will do good to advance Gallhouse to second. And it brings up Curran Miner with a chance to take the game to a tied score. Only one out and a runner in scoring position. In this situation, Tampa has been one of six so far, so not great, but Miner is due for a hit. But still a great sacrifice nonetheless because all of a sudden the tying runner at second and only one out. 
So one out, the first pitch to Miner. That's going to be taken inside for ball one. We saw a really entertaining game here last night, and it's been the same thing here so far this afternoon, and shapes up for a great second game of this doubleheader as well. So the 1-0 from Connor to Miner. Miner's going to line it to short, but it's going to be misplayed. Gallhouse will be able to advance to third with one out. And so that'll be another error for Nova Southeastern. Samantha Burke not able to corral that. It would have been huge to get a second out, and she actually would have had a chance at maybe a double play if it was corralled, but instead it gets Miner her first chance to get on base. The other thing that changes now is I talked about the sacrifice and how important it was because it gave the Spartans a runner at second with only one out. Well, now you still only have one out, and that runner's now at third. So the Spartans very close, a great opportunity to at least tie the game here in the bottom of the seventh. So Lexi Chevalier now up with one out and runners at the corners. A chance to bring that tying run home. And it's going to be Kerr and Miner just swiping a bag and stealing second. So now two runners in scoring position here for the Spartans. Wow, wow. And no challenge there at all from Emerson Morris, potentially just to make sure Gallhouse didn't try to steal home then right back. So with that first pitch taken, it's 0-1 to Chevalier. Two runners in scoring position. The go ahead, tying run at third potential winning run at second. Chevalier is going to pop this into the infield and it is secured by Tia Williams and that'll bring it to two outs right here. Well that's unfortunate. That's obviously not what Chevalier had in mind. They'll have Alexa Russo at the plate now to see if she can get the job done of at least bringing in the tying run. As you see head coach Leslie Cantor having some words with her hitter before Russo steps into the batter's box. Interesting that Russo's 0 for 3, and we saw in, earlier in the game that a change was made with Steph Ballmer, who was 0 for 2 at the time. No change being made here, even though Russo is 0 for 3. So Cantor showing her confidence, her trust, and Alexa Russo. So Russo here, the 0-0 from Connor. That's going to be taken for strike one. And for Russo, it's an extremely high pressure at bat. And in the circle, even more high pressure for Connor. The save on the line, a potential win on the line for both teams in game one. And forgetting the fact there's a game two right after this, we don't know how this one will finish. That's why it's so exciting. That one's going to be taken up high. If that went wild, it could have sent the tying run home. So a good grab by Morris to make sure it didn't. Yeah, huge play. Huge play by Morris because... That had tying run comes home and the person of Mariah Galhaus written all over it. The one and one to Russo. Russo is going to pop this up. It will be an out. And the Sharks take a 3-2 victory in game one. A disappointing end for the Spartans. They bring one run home in the bottom of the seventh. But Connor is able to secure the save. And the Spartans win or take a loss, 3-2. And they fall right here to 0-2 in the series right now against Nova Southeastern. And thank you for tuning in. But listen, we're not done yet. It's a doubleheader. And we'll be right back as the Spartans will be hungry to try to steal at least one game from this series. And the Sharks will be hoping to get a win as or well to secure a sweep. And your thoughts on the game, Bruce? Well, you know, the Spartans, we've talked about it before. They ended up leaving nine runners on base, which is the same total as last night. You lose a game by only one run there's the difference right there and nova southeastern almost tried to hand this one to ut with some of the errors that they committed they finished with three errors in the game and the spartans were right there they had eight hits they out hit the sharks who had seven and ut have said it too many times now they really need to clean up some of these fundamentals it's a long season and a lot of these things are going to come back to haunt them as we saw last night as we saw in game one and hopefully they can wipe the slate clean and turn it around starting with the second game of the double header very entertaining softball nonetheless and i anticipate only the same for our second game in a little bit yep so we will be right back game two coming up very soon